Today's guest is Brock Tenhouten of Intrinsic Power. We all know about the EV world right now, its current state, and how it can be very polarizing. There are some people who are all for it and people who, you know, just simply don't think the technology is there. But Brock and his brother were in the game from way early on and understood exactly where they wanted to take the industry and anticipated that there would be specific problems that needed to be accounted for. And all the things we are seeing with any other vendors that are not intrinsic power, you can see that the anticipated problems were not addressed, whether they knew about them or not. But intrinsic power didn't move that way. And every problem that they've identified and laid out, as you'll see in this conversation, was taken into consideration in the development of their technologies to address these problems, to move us all towards a situation where the EV and general renewable energy products that we use and love and are excited about move further and further away from dependence on the actual grid. So without further ado, Brock Tenhouten. Brock, again, man, uh, I can't thank you enough for stepping in here and joining us with the Great Daily Show. I'm super excited because right now, more than ever, the conversation has really been around green, renewable tech things of that nature. So the fact that I get to have someone in the hot seat who has a lot of experience in this space and can make it a little easier for us to understand what's real, what's not, things of that nature, I think it's going to be a very exciting treat. So with that said, first of all, uh, the aha moment, right? I like to go there. At what point in both like the energy and transport transportation sectors of like the, just being in that journey, being involved? At what point did it start to make sense for you? This is where I need to be involved. Like, do you remember you know, that day? You know, I I've known that this was coming for a long time from the start of EV when we were working on converting the first electric vehicles and we were working on bringing new EVs out and then continuing when we started working on niche vehicles and we were making motorcycles and, and supercars and these kinds of things. Uh, I, I realized that once these vehicles got to production, the grid infrastructure wasn't going to be able to keep up with charging them all. And I, I think it's something that other people recognized as well. And, and there are other solutions that have come about to address it. Uh, in a non-integrated way, but the real aha moment came in 2015, and it was actually my brother Dave who came up with the idea to integrate solar and energy storage and charging all into one unified system that took care of it for the customer. And that was the the aha moment was there. It wasn't so much about the problem; we knew the problem was coming. It was about how the solution should be done, and it's different than the way the industry does it. Yeah, it's one of those very similar to solar panels being installed. And now one of the biggest issues is, well, who's going to service and repair all, and like maintain all these, right? There was going to be a whole aspect to the uh, value chain of this product or, 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 if you will, this vertical that wasn't being addressed. And it seemed like you had already anticipated this was going to happen. And so you positioned yourselves um, together. Now, I didn't see this in the notes, but was it you and your brother founded this together or how did this work out? We did. Uh, so we, we started Intrinsic Power to address this problem. And, you know, we've both been working in electric vehicles uh, for the past 15 years. And we've brought multiple vehicles to market, and, uh, both large scale and, and small scale. And we saw that there was this charging infrastructure problem coming. And Dave had that, the idea for this. And we continued to work on EVs because the idea was too early. Uh, we realized that the, uh, you know, that we were ahead of the time and we we're ahead of the problem. And really, it's not until the vehicles start arriving at scale that it becomes a problem. And, you know, we've seen a change in solar installations uh, where all of the solar installations uh, of those solar installations, only two, three percent would have energy storage included with the solar panels. But last year in 2022, for the first time, we saw a spike in the energy storage installations along with the solar. It's approaching almost 9%. And so what's happening is there are changes to the net metering laws and there are changes to the amount that's being paid for energy being pushed back onto the grid that's now making it economical to have energy storage with the solar. 
and your payback periods actually become shorter when you include the energy storage, even though there's this big upfront expense of including the systems. And so the way the industry has gone, they've brought uh, different solutions in order to try and solve this distributed energy problem. Everyone's solving the same problem. We don't have enough power. We don't have enough energy, especially locally. And so a few solutions are solar panels, uh, energy storage and home backup. And then, uh, you know, these, these things are treated as separate. And then charging is also treated separately, where you have this battery in the vehicle and charging is, is a separate industry. And what people haven't realized, and this is the fundamental misunderstanding in the industry, is that the distributed energy problem is really one problem. And those are just separate solutions for how to address it in a siloed way. And separate companies have grown up addressing each of those and, and dealing with it like it's all three separate industries. It's not. There's one industry. And that one industry is, is solving the distributed energy energy problem, both for homes and, and commercial buildings. And so what we really need to do is to have an integrated solution that manages that power in real time, sends it where it needs to go, and, and take it from the vehicle, give it back to the vehicle, always take it from the solar panels when it's available, and have a battery to store it. And if you bring all those things together and make a truly integrated solution with a common back end that's in real time, uh, using the most uh, optimized algorithm for sending the power where it needs to go based on machine learning and understanding the schedules of the driver and the people, then you have something that's different and then you have something that's better. And that's really what we need. This is fantastic because there's a few people I've spoken to on the show that take such a broad strokes view of their industry. And you're right. It's missing the whole point when people think that one vertical seems to be, or one aspect of an industry seems to be completely separated from the ecosystem that would make the entire industry as a whole sustainable and scalable. And knowing that the team behind Intrinsic has looked at it like that from the beginning and has been thinking forward in that way in the development of their products and services, whether it's the mobile application that I see is available uh, on the website that, that is talked about, you know, to really having that whole philosophy be involved and taking the power from where it is to where it needs to go at all times in a constant uh, what's the word? vigilance of how it's running its current state and where it needs to go. And if it has enough and what to do to anticipate that, that's exactly what this industry has been missing. And now I know that this exists. You know, I'd like to take a moment to borrow your expertise and have people really understand what it really is because a lot of people are still hesitant, right? There are homeowners who still haven't shifted over, right? There are automobile owners who still haven't shifted over. And yet there is more and more growing evidence that this is going to be the way. Right now, a lot of them are hesitant because of infrastructure. Sometimes people point out, oh, you know, they're using coal to make the electricity. Does that, you know, but I'm personally on the other side of it. I believe one way or another, we have to transition. The thing is, how are we going to do that? Right. I'm not invested enough or involved enough to understand the intricacies in that way. But because you are, can you speak to that to help us understand specifically based on someone who's been in the game since early on? anticipated the problems, are building solutions to those problems instead of just complaining, right? Like a good entrepreneur does. Can you sort of bring us home on that and just help us see things the way you do about this industry and about what we're doing? Sure. And, and the big picture is that there are more EVs coming than the grid can support. And we're already seeing it. Electric prices or, or electricity prices are rising. Dollars per kilowatt hour are going up. It costs more to charge a vehicle, more charge costs more to light your home. And, and what's happening is that uh, the rate structures are changing to address the time of day when it's most difficult to supply the power. And in areas where more electric vehicles are being introduced, it's really creating a problem for the grid. And then on top of that, there's a problem of local infrastructure where transformers might not be sized in your neighborhood to support the, the EVs that are coming there. We need to be able to charge all these EVs and there's only more electric vehicles coming and it's creating this, this significant grid infrastructure problem. And we need to create some independence. 
uh, we're we're seeing it in the raise of price, the the rising prices, but we're also seeing it in the stability of the grid. We're having more power outages than we have had, and uh, you know there's there's stability problems locally and and in larger areas of the grid. And the solution is to have more flexible charging for vehicles. So you charge the vehicles when there's power available, and you are careful about how much you take, and you're sensing the grid, and you're being cautious about how much power you're taking. So that you're not disrupting the local grid and you're in communication with the grid. And then you're also taking into account the status of the car and the needs of the user. And, you know, if if a user plugs in and their car is 90 percent charged and you know they're not going to leave for another few hours, uh, there's no need to start charging right at prime time. You can wait a little bit. You can run at lower power. But if they plug in, the car's empty and, you know, based on their calendar and their typical usage that they're going to need to go soon, you better charge them at full power. And people want to charge fast when stuff like that happens. They need to charge. And so if you create these integrated solutions, then you can really deliver that. And so we have two solutions that we're offering. One is a smarter charger than what's out there today. And it automatically does all of these things and provides these these uh, algorithms for really being intelligent about how we charge vehicles. And that'll do a lot for charging your vehicle faster, uh, doing it on less infrastructure upgrades in your home. And then uh, on top of that, it will reduce your power rates because it's going to know what your rate schedules are in your neighborhood and in your area and what your plan is. And it's gonna optimize to that within your needs. And by doing that, we really are taking what looks like Honeywell-esque solutions. And there really is just a full commodity market today of Honeywell-esque solutions. And we're bringing the first Nest-like solution for EV charging. And it's something you don't have to think about. You don't have to be an engineer to use it, but it's smarter than all those other systems that require a lot of, of handholding to make them even work. And then uh, the extension of that is our Renew 100, the next product behind it. And that includes bi-directional AC and DC charging, as well as solar integration and energy storage, 20 kilowatt hours of energy storage, all in a single enclosure, all with one back end, all working together, all with one set of power electronics. And that system is really a, a breakthrough. And what people are doing today in the industry that want to have this sort of independence from the grid and want to be able to charge freely and, and want to be able to keep their power rates low, they're getting solar plus energy storage, and then they're installing chargers. And it's a big barrier. That's a large cost putting all those systems in. And, and what we do is we take all those systems, and it actually winds up being eight subsystems that you have to put together to get this kind of solution. We we'll put them all in one enclosure and manufacture it in the facility as opposed to having a custom installation at the home, which is really not value added. And by doing that, we reduce the installation cost of one of those systems by 15 grand before you even account for the chargers that come along with it. And then uh, you're, because you're managing the power in real time and the energy in real time for the customers, just like you are on the, on the smarter EV charger, the CR50, the Renew 100 then saves customers $1,000 plus a year in their energy bills. Wow. So I, I had, first of all, I love that you first laid out all the current obstacles that people are facing and then said, and that's why we built the products that we built to account for all those algorithms that are necessary to help lead the way because this is the worst this technology will ever be, meaning it's only going to get better and it's only going to iterate and develop to continue to slowly push forward and address these problems to the point where I imagine the future is one day we can make it so that it's like going to a gas station where it charges the way that it, you know, it takes how long to fill the tank, right? Which is the other obstacle. Uh, and the, that pe that keeps people from actually adopting, let's say an EV vehicle, right? Uh, let alone running on solar at home or what have you, right? But I had no idea it was so cost prohibitive uh, to have all this infrastructure just to want to be someone who's going green and helping move things forward that's a lot that people have taken on that I'm learning. And I'm grateful that Intrinsic as a team is stepping in, calling it how they see it and saying, well, then that's what we have to build. And is that sort of the way that process works? I imagine you have many patents and things of that nature. Is it a constant observation of the industry, what needs to be done, and then iterating on that product? Or what does that look like in terms of your process as a team? 
Absolutely. I mean, we've been working in EV for more than 15 years and we've been with the customers. We are the customers. We understand the problems. We've been working with utilities and, and all this has come from is the, you know, the culminated effort of understanding that problem and, and how to solve it. And, you know, I'm really glad you brought up the gas station like nature of, uh, of EV charging. And that's one problem. And, and really, uh, destination charging is not the way that people want to charge their electric vehicles. They're doing it because they have to. What people really want is they want to charge their vehicles just as they go out about their business. Wherever they park, they want to have a charger. They want a charger at home. They want a charger at work. They want a charger at the grocery store. And, you know, this idea of going to a special location and sitting there for some amount of time that's more than pumping gas while your car charges that's not how people want to do it. And the reality is we need ubiquitous charging. And what we're doing at Intrinsic Power is we're providing ubiquitous charging within the constraints of the electrical grid. And so when you go to an office building, there shouldn't be three charging stations because everyone's planning on transitioning to electric vehicles. There should be charging stations in, in all or almost all the parking spots. And it should be the same everywhere you go. There should just be EV chargers there. The power grid reaches everywhere. If you have chargers that are smart about how much power is available and is careful about how much is available from the grid and, uh, you know, is directed by and understands the rate structures, you can have them everywhere. And if you can share breakers and be flexible and have dynamic power uh, capability like we have, then you can start installing uh, many more systems with much lower infrastructure cost. And that's really what we realized is that that people don't want to charge along the highway or at destination stations unless they're on a big road trip. Other than that, you should just be charging as you go around. This is fascinating because what I'm hearing is the technology can be there to be implemented to create that reality. So then the issue or the the biggest challenge and you alluded to this in passing earlier, is this electrical grid, which means then the relationship with the utility companies and what that looks like is going to be very paramount to the success of this entire uh, initiative, regardless of what company. It's like, it's, like, it's like company agnostic, right? So the competition isn't necessarily what should be people's concern right now for an industry that's this young and still in its development, right? And then uh, what that looks like in terms of the current state of the infrastructure, right? Uh, this is sort of akin to the way databases right now are struggling with how much water they're using uh, from other companies that I've interviewed and how, to be honest, they said the best way you can help to move things forward is to join us in the development of more bespoke databases that continue to bridge the gaps with all of our data usage. And I think the same thing would be said here, except the electrical grid is a little older, a little more established, and there's a lot more red tape, you know, with the bureaucracy and things of that nature uh, to move forward. What has that challenge been like? And is there anything you would invite others who are listening, who are entrepreneurs, that they can do to help improve the industry as a whole, given your vast experience in this space? Yes. And, and you know, the uh, you mentioned the grid, even though the grid is old, uh, you know, and, and obviously has been operating for a long time, they understand they have this problem. They know it is it's here and they're ready for a solution. And NREL and, and uh, uh, the CEC put out a publication all the way back in 2018 saying that we needed new technologies for charging EVs for this problem that's coming. So they, they also understand that there's this issue and they, they're, they want a solution to it, but it's not their place to create these technology solutions. It's, it's industry's place. And if you look at what the EV charging solutions look like today, they're not advanced enough. And it seems strange to say that an industry that's only 15 to 20 years old is already getting stale, but it is. They didn't innovate enough at the beginning. The problem of all these EVs coming wasn't the problem they were solving when they started. There were only a small number of EVs, but now we need a higher level of connectivity and intelligence in these chargers. To make sure that we're not disrupting the grid and that we're communicating with the grid. And so I would suggest anyone that wants to be a part of this, uh, reach out to me. 
let's be a part of this together and create smarter chargers and build a stronger infrastructure of integrated solutions that bring solar and energy storage and charging together and really bring independence to homes and buildings in order to create a stronger charging infrastructure for the EVs that are coming. I love that. I mean, said like a true leader, I'm here for that conversation. You said, regardless of what you're doing, you want to get in the space. Great. We could use the help. Talk to me. We'll figure it out. Yeah, no, I, I love that, man. Intrinsic power. This is definitely one of those things where I see that strong leadership is what's going to be at the helm of whether or not this continues to, to innovate where it needs to, to the, at the speed it needs to, because it, what it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, whatever technology is currently there, like right now you currently have smarter uh, electric vehicle charging at home, right? Which is like one aspect you were telling me already about how uh, difficult it is in terms of charging at home and the rates that you get and what you're allowed to do, when you're allowed to do it, things of that nature to make it uh, affordable. That's one aspect of it, right? But It sounds like you're already iterating on other things. Is there anything you want to talk to the listener about that they should know about that you're currently working on or that you currently want them to go check out? Yeah, I think that the best thing to do is is to keep an eye out for us to sign up for our uh, uh, newsletter on intrinsicpower.com. And and, uh, as the CR50 becomes available, uh, buy one of those, install it, see how much it saves you and, and let us know. And, and really uh, uh, allow us to be more efficient with the energy for your EVs, uh, allow you to charge more EVs in one location, at a building, at a house, uh, and, and then keep an eye out for that second solution and have the systems that integrate solar and energy storage. And that's where we're going to really be working with solar installers uh, to uh, save money for people that really are ready to take that step of being really energy efficient and green and also uh, creating some grid independence and saving money at the same time. I love that. And is there is there a a baseline for how large the company of the solar installers is, or are you working with like just across the board? If they're in the space, they can reach out to you too. It's just across the board, you know. And and I think that the the best fit for us is probably not the top few, and uh, you know they they've got their own visions for how things should go and. Uh, we're looking to give an advantage to the ones that want to grow and and compete with them. I'm loving it, man. No, I listen. I think this has been an enlightening conversation on the realities of the industry itself, which, as we've learned through discussion, the more people we can get involved and understand the actual problem at hand. It's like you said, you know, they this whole thing started building out what they thought was one, two three different problems and not even connected. And you already knew you and your brother uh, from the beginning that this was going to be an entire ecosystem and an integrated one in regards to distributed energy. Right. And so knowing that that's the case and then creating the invitation, I can already see where this company is going to go in the future. And do you have, have you taken the time? And this is the, the, the big finale here. So you can, you can go with it or say, I, I don't know. Have you taken the time to look at what the future that you want to see, what it looks like, what that vision is? Can you lay that out? What, what does, what does it look like when Intrinsic has done their job? I think that there's going to be a larger movement towards distributed energy, uh, not just at home and not just at the office, but everywhere. And I think that the uh, total reliance on the power grid to supply energy is going to be reduced. And that's going to make uh, energy generation cheaper, more efficient on top of making the grid more stable. And it's going to be much more efficient. And so what we're going to see is this energy, uh, you know, in the form of distributed solar at all of these locations I mentioned, plus energy storage at these areas. And then each one of them needs to have a brain that's able to control the energy management that's that's being provided. And it's all part of this larger electrify everything movement. And as your heating uh, turns to to be energy based and you're cooking and and you know, the whole house moves away from these other sources of energy and your vehicle is transitioning to electric and your lawnmower and and these kinds of things, you're going to need to manage all that power. 
And intrinsic power intends to be the brain for all of that and provide that management and provide the hardware in order to control that power in a much more efficient way. Amazing. And did you, I should have asked this earlier, and I, I know I said that was the last question, but now I'm curious, did you bootstrap this with your brother? Did you raise money for this? What did that look like? We've been bootstrapping it uh, since Oof. the beginning. Yeah. And and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, we may have continued to bootstrap it all the way to production. And, uh, you know, the, the main thing was the change in the net metering regulation, which is driven by the needs of the grid to protect the grid in order to make sure that they have enough power at the right time and to encourage this incorporation of battery systems. And we know we need to speed up. And so that's the, the uh, transition to accepting outside funds for the first time is uh, to speed up because of, we see that change in the regulation and the market. And in order to, to, to catch the tailwinds, we know we need to accelerate. Right on. No, I'm glad. So then I take it that whoever's listening, if they do know someone with capital that wants to get involved, again, connect and reach out to you. Yeah, it'd be great. Right on. Brock, thank you so much for stopping by, man, for putting us on to what the game is really all about here in renewable energy technology. And really just overall for being able to explain that in a way that was really easy to understand. Thank you for stopping by, man. Thanks for having me, Phil. It's great to be on and, and uh, always a pleasure.